purpose of the public hearing uh, is to provide interested parties with the opportunity to comment on the proposed revisions to Sundown zoning bylaws. Proposed zoning revisions include changes to section 125, article 1, 2, definition section, uh, section 125, article 2, 2, use regulations, section 125, article 4, 1, flexible development, 125, article 4, 2, major residential, development and section 125 article 4 3 planned unit development overlay district there's one section uh, proposed for deletion section 123 article 4-4 development rate limitation and one new section proposed section 123 article 4 4 accessory dwelling unit So I'd like to start um, by just um, going over the summary. Uh, and after I go over the summary, I'm gonna go through the, uh, the actual bylaws page by page and tell you every single, every single um, change uh, that we're proposing. So we've been working with uh, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments for um, probably close to a year uh, on uh, this proposed uh, set of changes and all of the changes um, are uh, addressing uh, affordable housing. Um, as we know, uh, we uh, do not currently um, meet our required 10% uh, of our housing stock um, as Massachusetts approved uh, affordable. And for that reason, um, we, uh, we uh, become hosts for uh, 40B projects where developers are allowed uh, to ignore the bylaws and um, build uh, as they see fit. So the planning board is trying to make it uh, more appealing to, to developers who are proposing developments to include affordable housing in their projects. So overall purpose is, in, is to encourage sustainable housing development that meets the sun, needs of Sunderland residents as, as identified in our housing plan uh, and to get to that 10%. Really that's the goal of most municipalities in Massachusetts is to get to that 10% goal so they're not uh, vulnerable to those uh, chapter 40 challenges so um, in, in general flexible development uh, didn't have a lot of incentives uh, for a developer to, to uh, pursue that route uh, so uh, in the changes that I'm going to go over uh, we're, we're basically uh, uh, reducing the percentage of units required from 20 to 10 for the smaller developments and lowering it to 15 for the larger developments just to encourage developers to include to uh, consider that option uh, on major residential uh, we uh, uh, that's developments over uh, four uh, units uh, requires submission of an affordable housing plan with information necessary for determining affordable units meet the required listing for 40B. And then uh, on the PUD, planned unit development uh, overlay uh, district, uh, we're trying to incentivize additional affordable units by allowing eight uh, dwelling units in the structure. Um, the development rate limitation was basically illegal. It's something that we did uh, in the early 90s when we were seeing uh, a, a boom and it's allowed for one to three years. We instituted it in the early 90s and we never uh, took it out of our bylaws. Uh, and you'll see here that uh, the court case uh, in Hadley citing uh, the uh, illegality of, of leaving that 
in perpetuity. Uh, and then finally, uh, an accessory dwelling unit section. So basically that allows a homeowner, the difference between the accessory dwelling unit uh, and the two family that we have now is you can convert a single house uh, to a two family or you can build a two family house, but you need one and a half times the size, the, the, the lot size. This, the accessory dwelling unit would not increase the lot size requirement, but it does uh, limit the size of the accessory dwelling, can't be more than 800 square feet, and it requires uh, a, an affidavit filed with the building inspector that the owner lives on premises. And if that changes, then the permit goes away. The permit can only be there if there's an affidavit that the owner lives there. So um, I'd like to just go through page by page and review each and every uh, change that we're proposing. First, um, in the definition section, we're adding the definition for accessory dwelling unit, and it's defined as a self-contained dwelling unit incorporated within a detached single family dwelling or within an accessory structure that's subordinate in size to the single family dwelling in a manner that maintains the appearance of the structure as a single family dwelling. If we flip through, we're gonna find our next change appears in the existing definition for a multifamily dwelling. We're adding one sentence to multifamily dwelling that says, in a planned unit development, a PUD, a multifamily dwelling may contain up to eight units in a structure, period. Next change appears in major residential. Major residential currently reads the creation of more than four lots or construction of more than four dwelling units. We're adding language except as part of a flexible development in accordance with section 125 article 4.1. Um, and then we just uh, make a further reference, see also uh, section 125 article 4.2. And those are the changes to the major residential development definition. Our next change appears in the use table. In the use table, we are adding two lines. The first line says accessory dwelling unit entirely within an existing one family dwelling or an accessory structure with no expansion. So if, if it's completely within my house or I can do it without expanding my house, I can do it with site plan review in the village residential, with site plan review in the rural residential, with site plan review in the village center, with site plan review in the commercial one, and it would not be allowed in the commercial two. The second kind of accessory dwelling is an accessory dwelling unit within a new one family dwelling or an accessory structure or where the installation of the accessory dwelling unit requires an expansion. So I'm putting it on the second floor, I'm building a second floor on my garage and gonna make a mother-in-law apartment on the second floor of my garage. So I've gotta put a dormer on my garage so there's an addition happening there. Requires the expansion of an existing one family dwelling or accessory structure, see 125 article 4 for accessory dwellings. So, so if I was doing it under this method, I would be required to get a special permit in the village uh, residential, a special permit in rural residential, a special permit in the village center, a special permit in the C1, and it would not be allowed in the C2. So. If there's no change to the, to, the, uh, to the existing structure, I still have to come to the town, but I meet with the planning board and ask for a site plan review. 
if I do need an addition or some change to the exterior of my building, I've got to petition the zoning board. The zoning board notifies all the abutters, and they go through their six criteria to decide on the special permit. Go ahead. Anything about septic systems? In terms of how big the lots are and what the guidelines are for a septic system for a lot size, for how many dwellings on a lot? Right, so there, we have not made an accommodation for, I, I think we were trying to do it with the 800 square feet that um, you, you can limit the number of people. Basically, if you, you know, the footprint of the house is gonna pretty much stay the same and you're going to accommodate another couple people within the house. It's a separate permit, really. I mean, this, uh, septic systems don't come under zoning bylaws. So. But it's an interesting point. Yeah, if, I, is, if, I, if I have an existing house, so I have, I've already established my septic right. system. So will uh, so, it trigger so, a review So the... was my septic system constructed to accommodate, yeah. uh, like, how, how do you build a septic? I don't know how you build a septic, but well, do you, you, is yeah, it so based on... Garage and you're making a mother-in-law apartment over the garage. Yeah. Is that going to go within the guidelines of how many people are on us, like the, you know, the three-quarter acre business was because of guidelines uh, on septic, and it was, excuse me. And the amount of, of uh, waste yeah. generated might require a different size system. What do you think about that, Bob? I think the number of people in the house, the number of bedrooms, is what governs the size of the Septic system. So you're adding more bedrooms on. If you may be adding, adding if you add if your septic system is designed for three bedrooms, your house has three bedrooms and you're gonna build a fourth bedroom, then you may trigger something as far as public health is concerned. And and that that would be the case whether I had an accessory dwelling unit or not. Right. I can have another kid and the new the new kid needs a new bedroom. And <laughs> you're also adding units with bonus spaces and stuff like that. Is there any restrictions on, I mean, there are septic systems that will handle it, but are, there, are you putting any restrictions on that it has to be one of the septic systems that handle the increase in um, uh, size for uh, you know people coming in right so so I'll tell you I'm gonna go and meet with the building inspector and I think when when I do any change or alteration one of the forms he gives me a pile of forms like this and I think one of the forms they gives me has to do with that question but I can't say that with absolute certainty so I'm gonna go and talk to him and have an answer for that question <clears throat> vote in town meeting and say to do it. If you do it without restrictions, then somebody can come in and say, I'm gonna put 50 units over here because I'll do this and this and this, and may not have a septic system that matches it. Yeah. That's I, I, I don't think, I mean, septic systems are not spoken to at all in the bylaws. So there, this, this is not really part of what we would cover. So the building inspector would always have to sign off on any alteration. And so that w should be part of the review, and then it should be sent. If if it triggers, you know, a, a, the need for a larger system, then it should be. I think that's definitely a germane question on a small yeah, lot. Yeah, I think we and, should clarify. And that. Uh, I, I want to know the answer to that. Right, but it's but it's not a, it's we don't talk about septic systems in the bylaws. Where did the, where did the three quarter acre come from? That was I know it was a, it was a, it was a guideline by the state for. Um, how much you could do right. for a septic system. Um, and again, you know, you're putting in units, you're doing that, shouldn't it say something about the septic systems? Yeah, so anytime you expand the number of dwellings in your, in, in your residence, I think you're required to follow through on, on all those things, but it's, it's not, it's... If there's no law against it, though, then people can just... I think, I think Bob is right that we, we, you are supposed to, you know, I'm not saying people always do, but you're supposed to go through this and if it, the building inspector is aware of it, it should be triggered.
And again, like, mm -hmm. like the, the, the 40 D that they're planning, you know, yeah. um, there are septic systems that work within a smaller area, a private septic systems that work within a smaller area. But there's nothing in the zoning or planning laws that say you have to do that in order to go here. Right. And there should be that there should be there should be something that that will go, you know, to protect wetlands and, you know, everything else that that the septic systems um, come within guidelines or it's a problem. And especially if you're doing like a large if you're doing like a an apartment complex or something. If there's a problem, it's going to be someone's problem. If, if there's nothing that says you have to have a system, you know, that fits the area and stuff. Right. So, so the accessory dwelling will just be for a, sing, a single unit, a single, the accessory, the accessory dwellings, is, we're not dealing with the apartment complexes. That's, okay. that's just a single family house with a mother-in-law apartment. That's all how we're talking many, about with accessory how many bedrooms are in the mother-in-law apartment? One or two. Got an 800. Well, that's 800 square feet. Square feet. Square feet. Square feet. The septic system works on three quarters yeah. of an acre. Now you're putting in an entirely different, you're putting in not only a building with bathrooms, with a kitchen, that type of thing. So the septic system, the, the septic becomes uh, an issue in the, the lot size. But so so, so you're, you're Elaine, is that? No. I'm sorry. It, just your name for the just for the minutes. Uh, Phyllis. Phyllis. Yes. Do you mind sharing your last name too, just for the for our minutes? <coughs> In terms of the zoning laws, what you guys are developing is septic something that you're able to regulate, or is that something? that is outside. Yeah, as Steve view. said, you're not going to find the word anywhere in this entire document before we change it or after we change it. The word does not appear. So uh, th there, there are, it's the Board of Health regulates, and so they've got a document just like this that deals with Title V and, and deals with all of those regulations. So I, I, I'm not just counting the, the, the the strength of the argument is it's a good argument and I want to know the answer I don't know the answer Dana I mean when the plant when the zoning board you know if you get a special permit situation uh, I mean it wouldn't be unusual for them to put a condition that you know they need to verify I don't know what the proper thing is to verify that the septic system is able to ex you know is able to accommodate the additional usage or something like that even though it's not really a zoning board requirement that's not our but it I mean, would be within your authority to add that as a, as a condition yeah, and you know hopefully they would go to the board of health or they go to the building inspector yeah. and get you know approval that and, and that's what that's why i want to talk to the building inspector because i think whenever you go to see him and say that you're going to do anything he gives you a thick stack and I think one of, the, one of the things in that stack is either you saying that it is going to have an impact or it isn't going to. So if you're on town sewer, has, yeah. I mean, you don't even deal with that. But if you're not on town sewer, then, uh, it, then there is paperwork that he wants you to, uh, to account for. When, you, when the planning board is a site plan review, do they issue conditions as well? Or how, how does that work? We have the authority to issue conditions. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's true that it somewhere that there are conditions that um, address the septic systems. Yes. Um, again, the, the three-quarter acre lot was the state guideline for it, and I know at the time the zoning board and the planning board went along with that to make that the, the minimum size of a lot because it fell within you know, within the guidelines, but they're not, they're not rules. Right. And is there a rule someplace that says that or, and I, that's my, my problem with all of this is that there, there should be rules somewhere that you can, you know, turn around and tell these people, yes, you can do this or no, you can't. Okay. Because of, because of the septic. 
think the rules come in from applying for the permit, the permitting process. One of the things that you're going to have to have is an approved plan for a septic system. And the, I believe the Board of Health is the issuer on those permits. That's correct. So if you're going to do this, you have to have a permit stamped and whatever by the building inspector so that he or she could give you a building permit. If you don't have that, he's not going to give you a building permit. Okay, I'm just, I'm not sure if the guidelines for septic um, are, are, you know, that he can, that even the, the Board of Health guy can say without. Yeah, the Board of Health mm -hmm. can say that. You have to have certain perk rates and design. Perk rates and the, the whole, well, the design the and everything, years. and that's, well, are you, are you permitting things that go beyond what, the design would be for it if this isn't a permit this does not issue a permit to build no it still okay. has to go before the building inspector so all right i'm going to move on but i will get back to that question um i, I don't have the answer to it but i'll find the answer to it uh, the next change uh, deals with flexible development. So basically, if you're, if you're building a large uh, um, multifamily structure, you've got two options. You can either build it uh, under the multifamily section or under the flexible development section. And what we've done here um, is just, uh, it, it was confusing uh, the, the way the existing bylaw reads we provide uh, bonus points and bonus lots and percentages and you have to do a lot of math and it's not exactly clear um, where, how uh, it, it benefits a developer to include an affordable unit. So what we've tried to do is simplify it and make it crystal clear with a table that says if, you make, if you're building five to ten units then you are required to have at least one of those units be uh, an affordable unit. If you're building 11 to 20 units, then you are required to have a minimum of two units. If you're building 21 to 26 units, you're required to have a minimum of four. If you're building 27 to 33, you're required to have a minimum of five. 34 to 40, a minimum of six. 41 to 46, a minimum of seven. 47 to 53, a minimum of eight. And 54 to 60, a minimum of nine. So basically we're just trying to simplify what we had before and make it clear to everyone what the requirements are. So there's no math, there's no way that it can be calculated one way by the planning board and another way by the developer. We, we, here's the table. Give us the number of units, we'll tell you the number that has to be affordable. That's under the flexible development section. Uh, when we go to major uh, residential, um, what we're trying to do there uh, is just outline for the developer uh, some incentives uh, to include the affordable housing uh, in the development to uh, encourage uh, the developer so we're trying to use the carrot rather than the stick right we're trying to make it uh, in the developers interest to include the units rather than um, force it upon him uh, the uh, the verbiage is really long and I'm certain that if I read it all uh, that it wouldn't make any more sense uh, to you. So um, the, the language itself is available um, at the town clerk's office. And um, if you're considering uh, a major residential development 
or a flexible development, all of the language um, is available in the town clerk's office prior to uh, the meeting. Um, the last um, change uh, that we are proposing is the ADU, the accessory dwelling unit, and that is a new section to the bylaw, and I will read that. So as we heard in the definition section, an accessory dwelling unit is a self-contained dwelling unit incorporated within a detached single-family dwelling or within an accessory structure that's subordinate in size to the single-family dwelling in a manner uh, that maintains the appearance of the structure as a single-family. Purpose. The purpose of permitting accessory dwellings is to provide older homeowners with a means of obtaining rental income, income, companionship, security, services, enabling them to stay more comfortable in homes uh, and neighborhoods they might otherwise be forced to leave, or provide younger homeowners with a means of obtaining rental income and thereby enabling them to own a home they may otherwise not afford, or three, uh, add moderately priced rental unit to the housing stock to meet the needs of smaller households and make housing units available to households who might otherwise have difficulty in finding housing. Or four, protect stability, property values, and the single family residential character of a neighborhood by ensuring accessory apartments are created only in owner occupied houses. And five, provide housing units for persons with disabilities. B, conditions and requirement. Planning board may issue a site plan in accordance with 125, 4B, uh, 41B, uh, site plan review for installation and use of an accessory dwelling unit entirely within an existing owner-occupied single-family home or existing detached accessory structure of an owner-occupied single-family lot. The Zoning Board of Appeals may issue a special permit in accordance with 125 Article uh, 43 special permit for the installation and use of an accessory dwelling unit within a new owner-occupied single-family dwelling or within a new detached accessory structure on an owner-occupied single-family house lot or within uh, an expansion of an existing single-family home or accessory structure. Site plan review or special permit shall be approved only when the following conditions are met. One, ADU be, complete, uh, be a complete dwelling unit with separate entry and contain a kitchen and bathroom and no more than two bedrooms. Two, gross floor area of the ADU shall not be greater than 800 square feet. ADU cannot be enlarged by future additions beyond 800 square feet. Three, only one ADU may be created within a single family house or house lot. Four, ADU may be located within and attached to a principal dwelling within an existing, an existing accessory structure, such as a garage or a barn, or within a new accessory structure located on the same lot as, a, as the principal single family dwelling. ADU must meet all front, side, and rear yard setbacks for the zoning district in which it's located according to 125 Article 2.3e dimensional schedules. Five, prior to special permit or site plan approve, the owner must submit a notarized letter to the building inspector stating that they will occupy one of the dwelling units as their permanent or primary residence, except for bona fide temporary absences. Upon sale or transfer of the property to a new owner, the new owner must submit a substantially identical notarized letter to the building inspector if such a letter is not submitted within 30 days of the recorded deed, special permit, or site plan approval shall lapse. Six, owner of the residence in which the ADU is created must continue to occupy one of the dwelling units as their primary residence. Special permit or site plan approval for the ADU automatically lapses if the owner no longer occupies one of the dwelling units. Seven, 
Any new outside entrance to serve the ADU shall be located on the side or rear of the building unless the Planning Board or Zoning Board of Appeals determines that a front entrance will not detract from the character of the surrounding neighborhood. Eight, ADU must have a minimum of one off-street parking space provided in addition to the off-street parking space as required for the single-family dwelling. No more than one curb cut or driveway access <coughs> shall be permitted unless the Planning Board or ZBA determines that the second curb cut will improve public safety and not detract from the rural, rural character of the road. At nine, uh, the design and room size of the ADU must conform to all applicable standards in the health, building, and other codes. A special permit or site plan review for an ADU may only be approved subject to obtaining any required approval from the Board of Health. Ten. An application for special permit or site plan review for an ADU shall include any information necessary to show proposed interior and exterior changes to determine compliance with the conditions of this subsection, including a plot plan, floor plans with proposed interior and exterior changes to the building, uh, modifications or waivers, no provisions of this section may be modified or waived. So the, the, uh, the condition number nine, uh, that room size must conform to the standards of health, building, and other codes, and a special permit or site plan uh, for the ADU may only be approved subject to obtaining approvals from the Board of Health. So I'm going to meet with the Board of Health, I'm going to meet with the boarding and building inspector and see what that means. What, what is, how, how does that address a septic system? If I, if I file with the town of Sunderland to build a three-family house and I design a three-family, uh, excuse me, a three-bedroom house and I design a three-bedroom uh, septic system and now I want to add up to two bedrooms what accommodation do I have to make to address my septic deficiency? Two bedrooms and a bathroom, yeah. at least one bathroom and a kitchen. The only thing that comes with bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> but if, unless, it were, unless it were really two buildings, that's, and then, no. okay. But, and, and you said one parking space? One additional parking space. So the, it says, uh, I'll uh, read exactly what it says. The ADU must have a minimum of one off-street parking space, so off-street, provided in addition to the off-street parking spaces required for the single-family dwelling. Okay, it's at a minimum of one. Yes. Uh, one of the things about the ADU, um, is it would increase the number of rental units in the town without? It would, I'm sorry. It would increase the number of rental units in town without, as it says here, affecting the 40B without helping us toward the 40B goal, yeah. which is a bit of a concern. But all of the the nice ideas of letting older folks keep their homes and incorporate maybe extended family or something into it. And the other things you talk about, young families, they're all temporary arrangements. And in the past, when temporary arrangements have been tried in this town and other places, for example, duplexes that must be owner occupied, that has been found to be illegal. Straight up. And it was found to be illegal well after people started ignoring the fact of that. And it happened de facto for many years because there is, in fact, no enforcement. People don't ride around on horseback looking for, you know, this kind of trouble. It, and it doesn't always get reported, not often get reported. So I'm not sure, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not sure it's legal. I'm pretty sure it's unenforceable into the officials that we fund and provide for in a town this, this side. And I get 
almost bet it's going to end up it's expanding student housing with which won't be enforceable by the number of people living there if experience in neighboring towns is is any example so it's going to expand over time the sort of rental housing that we don't like without uh, helping us toward the 40 B goals. Is there any way you can get it to be 40 B? Or is that totally off the... I guess um, we've, we've heard from people that think uh, that our bylaws are too strict, that, that they're trying to accommodate uh, an elderly relative or, or a, a, a student that uh, has uh, some learning disabilities or some kind of family situation and they don't have the land. So they, they don't, they're, they're, their situation doesn't allow it. And, and, and we tried to, in writing this, respond to that need that we'd heard. And the, the way that we tried to do it was the affidavit to the building inspector um, saying uh, that I swear I'll live here, and if I stop living here, uh, then I lose my right to do this. That, that's the way that we approached it. As far as I know, well, we, we had this discussion because you're, I, I know what you're saying about the uh, owner-occupied issue. And, and as far as I know, it's not illegal to have that, but you're right, it's very difficult to enforce. And that's why we're I, I was told it's not legal because I came to the town saying, hey, you know, this is going on all the time. So, yeah. so yeah, right. we try it once, but we, we don't try that anymore. It's, we can't legally. It, it had been dropped from our zoning bylaw some years ago. Uh, there has been discussion about adding it back in. Uh, there are a number of places where, where it is part of their stipulation. And so this, this has come up a number of times. But I, I'm not clear that it is illegal to have such a requirement. It's just... It uh, doesn't work. It's, difficult it's to enforce. Difficult to enforce. And so with this, this is a little bit different uh, in that we're in putting it into play, we're trying to create a situation where it's much harder for somebody to say they were unaware of, you know, it's restricting their ability to do something with their land that they thought they should be able to do, uh, uh, you know, because they have to file the affidavit right from the be beginning. Um, they have to attach it to the deed. Right. Um, so. How do you make them do that? Well, it's, I mean, it's, if they want to get the permit, they have to file that with the building inspector. and. And so now their, their affidavit is filed with the building inspector. So it, it's, I, I, I understand your concern, but I, I, you know, I think we're trying, to res we're trying to walk a difficult path here. Did you do that with, with duplexes before? Um, that's before my time. And that, even the, the removal of that rule was before my time, so. I think we're all uh, sympathetic with with uh, people, uh, especially over over those fixed incomes, whatever, trying to keep their homes, trying to keep the families together, and um, we're all, I think, in theory and with our hearts, support that. Uh, just to express the concerns I have about yeah. about this, when the, this particular old person passes away. And the estate owns it, or it sells for whatever reason. Somebody and enforcing that down the road. It's got to be owner occupied. Can't see it happening. Well, it given, I, I think it's different. I, I, I honestly do because I think this goes into it right up front with this affidavit and make pretty, pretty clear. I think the language. Um, it, and I can't speak to what the old rules were because they really go back to the long before I was on the board. But. So we actually we have a second um, public hearing tonight. Well, Dana, to, be, before you leave that, I just got, I got a question. Uh, this accessory dwelling unit bylaw, I mean, yeah. 
Is it was it modeled after another? I mean, are you yeah, the, was developed the, by the Cog wrote it. Does the, does it exist in? Do we know if it's working in other communities? I, I will get you examples uh, of where it's been adopted. It's just, just a curiosity yeah. thing. I mean, we, we aren't reinventing the wheel sort of here. Is no, we, we really try to plagiarize as much as possible. <laughs> well, no, and, and if it's known to be at least effective, it's <laughs> encouraging. We have a second public hearing at the same location. Excuse me, Dana? Yeah. Um, you're taking off the number of dwelling units per, that can be built per year. And I guess I understand the, the issue in terms of illegality, in terms of being open-ended. But the question that I would raise is, is there any way of reinstituting that? Because if something happened in the valley where all of a sudden you need a pile of houses to be built, somebody comes in and says, okay, I'm going to build a 40-unit subdivision to go with the, the uh, 134 down in off of Plum Tree, then what happens to all of our infrastructure? And the reason that it was instituted in the first place, way back, was because there was felt the pressure from the university in terms of coming in and developing houses. So, right. So, so it's meant the 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 uh, cap on the the number of uh, building permits that you can issue in a year is meant as a temporary measure while you're getting your zoning together, while you're getting your act together, suddenly we're, we're getting all of this development pressure that we can't deal with. We need to put on the brakes. You can do it for, I believe, up to three years, uh, beyond three, to, to change, basically to change your zoning to address whatever problem that you perceive uh, to be. It can't be a permanent measure that and, and the, the cap was 10 or 15, and we never, we never uh, met the cap. We, we had, in, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, we had a, a ton of growth, and we, and we instituted it, and then things just kind of really slowed down, and it just never uh, became an issue. But if, if, if we wanted to go back and revisit it, uh, if the question is, could we? Yes, we could, but it can't be in perpetuity. I'm just wondering whether or not you could just keep rolling it over every three years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the fact that we've had it written here since 1990 uh, is, <laughs> is a little bit uh, 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 conspicuous. <laughs> There are um, two zoning issues on the town warrant. Uh, this one that we've been discussing uh, is Article 14. Um, Article 15 on the town meeting warrant it is, is a citizen's petition. And this is what it says. Uh, to address a citizen's peti petition submitted to propose, quote, amending zoning bylaws as follows, map six, lot 34, 63 Amherst Road is currently zoned C1 and village residential, commercial and residential parentheses, and petitioner would like a vote to make the entire property C1. That's what we have. Um, so I thought uh, that the petitioner would come to the public hearing on this, but I do not see the petitioner here. Um, the uh, language uh, that we received from town council says, the warrant does not identify the proposed amendments, nor does it make reference 
to any document on file with the town which could be consulted to learn the content of the proposed amendment. At the town meeting, the moderator may conclude that the Warren article does not sufficiently describe the changes requested and rule the motion out of order. That would be the moderator's call. The article in question is a citizen's petition article uh, and the Board of Selectmen is without authority to amend the article's language and that article must be printed on the warrant as presented in the petition. So, petitioner files it. He doesn't file it exactly right according to uh, the, uh, the town lawyer. He doesn't provide uh, the map or the reference material like this, this stuff that we just went through. If you want to spend all day looking at this or in the next week looking at this, you can go down and sit in the town clerk's office and spend as much time as you want with this. We have just basically the petition itself on this change. Um, and we don't have any supporting documentation. And that's what the town council is flagging here. So we, we can't not put it on the warrant. So here it is right here. That's, that's what we have is a petition with the signatures and it says to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaws as follows. Map 6, Lot 34, 63 Amherst Road is currently zoned C1 and Village Commercial and Residential and would like a vote to make the entire property C1. So, um, I, I made my own map, uh, and this is my own map um, of the property. So, um, just for um, folks uh, interested, um, this, the commercial district, so this is Main Street, this is 116 here, um, and the property abuts 116. And our commercial district in this part of town goes 500 feet off the center line of 116. So not quite, a little more than a third, less than a half of this property is currently zoned commercial. So this would extend the commercial zone from 500 feet to, by my calculation, something like, I don't know, 1,100 uh, feet, and take it right up to, you know, we, we have structures uh, on Main Street uh, that, that are currently in the same proximity as the commercial zone. When you say structures, uh, you mean residences? Right, or? I'm saying structures. I did not say residence, okay. I'm saying structures. There are, there are one, two, three structures, they're, they're barns, okay. that are directly behind residences on Main Street. So basically, what, what the planning board would like to see is a buffer between our historic district, our, our residential zone, and our commercial zone. And if we start allowing um, landowners to kind of arbitrarily uh, extend the commercial zone from 500 feet to 1,100 or 1,200 feet and then uh, the owner of lot 33 says well you know if that's commercial I want mine to be commercial and then 42 says well I want commercial too and 39 says and suddenly you know we have no buffer at all uh, zoning by its nature is restrictive and you know whether you like it or not it's it's supposed to be for the benefit of all and I don't know the, the petitioner should be here to argue um, why this benefits the town but um, 
What is that property on 116? Would we recognize it? Oh, uh, you would recognize it, yes. It's, current, it's currently got storage units on it. I see, yes. The question that pops into my mind is because it specifically identifies a given parcel of land, does that fall under spot zoning? Right, so that was my question to town council. And town council gave me an ambiguous answer. My, my feeling is that it is spot zoning because it extends the zone back. Had it extended the zone parallel, I'm not certain that it would be, but the, the extension of the zone so far back, I think it is, but the town council was not um, did not definitively say yes or no. They said this argument can be made to say it is, this argument can be made to say it isn't. I, I, I would have preferred a much more black and white answer. What is spot zoning and what's the implication of it? If it right, so spot other? zoning is when, when you on Falls Road say um, I want to have uh, a bakery in my house and uh, that's a commercial use so I need my lot down on Falls Road uh, to be zoned commercial and nothing around me is commercial and we're going to zone your house commercial so that you can have your bakery and all of your neighbors still have the existing zone so we are spot zoning that and that that is frowned upon and and I'm not sure if it's illegal but it's borderline um, whether or not it's it would um, uh, be approved by the Attorney General but in in the most blatant and and uh, raw terms that's what it is so the the ambiguity here is that half of the lot is already commercial so so extending it, we're, we're, we're literally in in your example on false road you're not touching any commercial so that's absolutely unambiguous black and white this would be touching some existing commercial land so there's some ambiguity about it thank you I mean, Dana, just to uh, add a little history to this parcel, uh, the storage units that were constructed there required a special permit from uh -huh. the zoning board five, eight years ago. I can't remember how long ago. Uh, at that time, he uh, actually, uh, I, I have to change my mind, because he did, he asked for a variance too, but his variance was to have the the structures get closer, go into the side lot. It wasn't, I was gonna say mm -hmm. that he, he came, to, came to us with a variance to try to do that, but no, the variance was to, uh, uh, to make wider buildings that would, would, would not meet the, the setback requirements. So uh, uh, there's, there's a provision in the bylaws that allowed the commercial use to go like an extra couple hundred feet into the residential district for, it, it's a special case that's in the bylaws for, yes. for uh, lots where it's so actually a, a lot, lot, a to, lot that's bisected by, by a zoning, zoning boundary that you can take a, a commercial use and extend, and extend it, it by some number of feet into the residential right. or vice versa. Okay, I was, I was gonna say that I thought he, the, the, the variance now is clear. He he wasn't getting looking for a variance to make it all commercial. He was doing something else. But uh, a special permit was required for that use. So, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Former Moderator, um, you know, I, it, it's got to be on the warrant. It has to be on the warrant. And the planning board has to have a public hearing, and that's why we're here. Uh, and so the town has met its obligation. Um, how much 
more. Um, it, it, it frustrates me because had the uh, had the landowner uh, needed a special permit, then he would be required to notify all of his abutters that this was his intention. But by filing this this method of just changing it, none of the abutters were were notified. So it just it doesn't seem right to me that um, this could happen in my backyard. It's not me, but it could happen in my backyard. And all of a sudden, I look out and what's going on back there? I thought that was farmland, and oh no, that got changed. When when did I get notified? It just is. It just seems strange to me that there isn't some regulation that says that you really can't petition for a change in zoning. Because it's always been my understanding that anything that dealt with zoning had to go through the planning board. Right, so the only, the only example so I can think question, of... The question becomes, what are we really going to be voting on? Are we going to be voting on changing in the zoning bylaw, or are we going to be voting on? Right, and that's just, so that's town council's issue is what what are we voting on, and how how have residents been given access to the information that we're voting on? And I don't, I don't know what. The answer to that is. I have to go with what town council says. Well, town council says that the moderator can just uh, declare it out of order and not uh, even not even, uh, put it to a vote. not even uh, bring it to a vote. So I don't I don't know what the timeline if there's a remedy between now and April 26th that uh, the petitioner can get whatever the the uh, missing information is uh, to the town clerk and somehow make it public that that information is available. I don't I don't know what if if there is a remedy. Has it already been published or when? The, the public hearing for tonight. No, no, I mean the uh, the, warrant. the warrant. Has it already been printed? I what? don't know. Yeah. Okay. The, the town council reviewed it today. I got town council's comments okay. today. Okay. So um, I, I would think that it's I don't getting think close. you can change the petition. Right. Oh, no, you, you, you can't change uh, the language that this, this language that was filed. So um, if, if if the petitioner were to come to town meeting and, and uh, ask the moderator to amend the language, uh, but, uh, but I'm not certain that that's what's needed. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just trying to follow the rules. And is the output of this hearing supposed to be a recommendation from the planning, the planning board, board must have a hearing and the planning board must issue a report or or a vote on the submission and that will include be included so it's sort of like a recommendation when it says something supported by the selectmen or recommended yes. by the selectmen or, yes. or not or, yes In fairness to the petitioner, he did come to the board and describe his desire to expand his facility because the existing facility is at or, or near capacity. And the board told him that that's not an action that the town would be uh, supportive of, but that 
uh, uh, anyone can uh, file a citizen's petition. Well, I, I think we said at the time that it would not look so be looked upon so well if it was just for his property as opposed to something that was, you know, a reasoned argument to extend the 500 foot to you know, to uh, more for all the properties along there. So I, I we did mention that to him, but I, he went the route of just just for his own lot, as far as I can see. So. So, anything else on either of the hearings that we've held tonight? Thank you all for coming, and thank you um, very much for um, your uh, excellent points about the septic, and I will I think this is the biggest turnout we've had for a hearing since I've been on the board, which is 11 years. <laughs> when we proposed, when we had our last one for the marijuana bylaw, we had the, uh, the reporter from the recorder. <laughs> that was it. So I, it, is, it is good because these changes impact us all, and we all should be um, interested and involved in, in these discussions. How, how much marijuana can we grow? <laughs> six, six plants, six plants no, no, per... I mean, in, in a commercial situation, what's the square footage? <coughs> You got the I don't, dialogue there? Uh, I have to dig through my briefcase. <laughs> uh, the Attorney General uh, approve uh, the, the, the marijuana yeah. bylaw? I think yeah. Okay. Have to have 10, square feet. Uh, the question is, what's what's uh, the limit on a commercial? We're proposing to cap theirs at 5,000. And really, I think that they're trying to discourage the growing in that case. It doesn't it have a volume, but it's a, a building up to. Up to exactly. Yeah. Five thousand. Yeah. It has to be indoors. Five thousand square feet. Five thousand. That's the same thing Hadley's doing. Five thousand. It's questionable whether or not it's economically viable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there five thousand square feet? Uh -huh. it, it's it's okay, is Bob. No, it's your retail or is that five thousand? <laughs> They're doing it in Waitley, they're doing it in Deerfield, they're doing it in Amherst. You've got plenty of sources, Bob. You don't have to, <laughs> don't have to get it in Sundorn. Uh, uh, yeah, but I like to buy local. <laughs> <laughs> that might be for the retail sale. I can't remember now. We're, we're, we're trying to yeah. dig that out. For Cultivation. Oh, for cultivation, you're not allowed, you're only allowed in C2, and it's up to 10,000 square uh, up feet. Up to 10,000 square feet. In C2. You can make a deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000. But the people in South Deerfield, they're growing it down uh, next to Barway Farm there. Yeah. They say that 10,000 square feet really is an economically viable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw that there's someone in Sheffield that got a permit yeah. to grow it outside. Outside. Huh. Sheffield. Yeah. That's, I that can't a, imagine like the fencing that's going to be required to uh, <laughs> to police to that. Get the bears out. It's just going to burn. Is that like growing six plants outside, or is that? Oh no 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 no! A commercial outside. operation like acres and acres and acres. Yeah. I think economic viability that we're saying is on like about 100,000 square feet. And not just because like that's the number of makes business sense, but there are facilities that do grow at 100,000 square feet, I believe, within Massachusetts. So in order just to be competitive. Yeah. That's, that's what that went up there. Or Thanks for coming, everybody. His name is Larry. There's some reason in the shortage of Night. All right.
All right, the AL. So as part of our public hearing, should we have our vote on recommendations? Yeah, so uh, I'd entertain a motion on the first round of uh, zoning changes, so the affordable housing zoning changes. Is there a motion to? Move to recommend. There's a motion second. to recommend. There's a motion in a second. Snyder, <laughs> And we're open for discussion. I will definitely follow up with the building inspector and see uh, what, uh, I mean, I think Can it's I? like a super good uh, point and I'm interested yeah. Yeah, to no, um, be able to answer that question. We should make sure that that's always, I think it was said in the bylaw, but we need to make sure that that gets triggered, that review. So. Yeah. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll move to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's four to nothing. So in the mode of normally doing these things as positive to vote, I, I will uh, move to approve the second. Okay, um, there's a motion to approve the citizen's petition. Is there a second? So no, normally you yeah. put these in the positive and then you can yeah. vote against them. Yeah. So rather, rather than confusing by him. Oh, okay, so all right. So I'm... There's, there's a motion to, and a second to, to approve the citizens' petition. Is there any discussion? I personally, although I move to approve it, I feel that it doesn't meet the goals of the town, or I'd like to see a discussion of expanding commercial if that's the appropriate thing we need along there, but I don't think this feels to me much more like spot zoning by choosing a particular lot, which would then surround other lots and impact many neighboring lots. So I, I, will, I will vote against my own motion. <laughs> Any more discussion? I'm with him. Hearing none, we'll Me move too. to a vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Nay. Nay. I, I mean, nay. nay. <laughs> so zero, four. OK, thank you. So other business? I see a bulldozer out here. They're mobilizing. Yeah, they're going to so start So tell us up what's happening. Soon the asphalt plants are open. Um, so we're planning our, um, we don't, we're not sure yet what we're calling it, but the opening day or dedication day or celebration day um, for July 13th. Mm. And the Neils are going to be playing. Oh, cool. Wow. Yeah. And um, We've got a lot of really cool stuff happening. There's gonna the Connecticut River Conservancy is gonna be leading a guided kayak tour up the river. Um, we're gonna have um, 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 Native American guided walks along the river, um, and different. Um, Nancy Pick's gonna do a dinosaur talk, <laughs> a talk about the dinosaurs that were here, and all kind, a whole bunch of different. There'll be recreational activities for kids and music and uh what day of the week ribbon is cutting that? it's a saturday saturday july 13th cool yeah and we um changed i don't i don't know if i shared this last no because we didn't meet last month um we changed the plan so now the the you know we had in the plan to expand the parking lot out there and it was going to be gravel yeah and we secured an additional uh, $32,000 contribution from the Department of Fish and Game, the boat ramp people. So that's going to be paved, um, and which will be a lot easier to maintain and paint and everything like that. Um, but they've been, you know, really great to work with. Um, we also got a huge um, donation from all states of asphalt. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. So. Um, we also got a contribution from Delta, so w w we've done really, really well, um, and we're kind of we have a budget surplus actually. <laughs> so <That's unusual. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it yeah, it's going really, really nicely, and um, so they're gonna start up um, pretty soon. I, I guess I guess they already brought yeah, well, in the bulldozer. I see a yeah. piece of equipment out yeah. there. So yeah, yeah. So I, I and I don't I don't think it's going to take them too long. I I, I think they 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 figure they're seventy percent done already. There's thirty percent more to do. Hmm. Um, they they prepared all the paths 
almost all of them. Um, so it was just to come in and pay if they did all the under the work underneath. Mm. CBA. CBA. Why well, can't I remember? <laughs> we have had some meetings, but I, I'm completely blanking at the moment. Um, well, we did have we did finally close the uh, 40B hearing and had a vote for the uh, 120 North Main Street. Um, so I, I forget how many meetings we've had since our, our last planning board meeting, mm -hmm. but, um, and voted in favor of, of going ahead. And I, I think there's conditional language because there's still some um, issues uh, that are being litigated or brought before the, um, the Mass De uh, Department of Environmental Protection. And so that, depend, pending that, I think um, otherwise we are, we uh, confirmed everything there. I mean, I, I think it was a much more complete application than for the sugar, sugar bush 40B. Uh, so that in that sense, we felt like they'd more than met the bar of what is expected for a 40B um, and really went above and beyond what is usually expected for 40B application at this stage. And so um, I think the zoning board felt that that was um, a good application from everything we could see. And then the only remaining issue is, is about wetlands and what the state has to say. So um, we, on the advice of, of Jay Tallerman, the, uh, town, the council who the town hired to help with this, um, we put in kind, kind of this conditional thing about kind of retroactively whatever the DEP requires, we will um, regard as part of our conditions for this. Mm. Well, that was a ton of meetings. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, that was <laughs> nice to see the uh, final vote on that. So, You have anything? No, I don't. You have anything else besides pathways? Um, Community Preservation Committee, we have one application this year, and it's uh, for APR funds. There's, um, I think it's Gun Farm is uh, putting a couple parcels into APR. Nice. Um, yeah. um, I can't think of anything else. I'm sure there's. All right. Are so still on TV? Uh, <laughs> next meeting, um, I am not available the second um, Tuesday of May. I am available the third Tuesday of May. Can we make our meeting the third Tuesday of May? We will have a new member by then, right? We will. The, the town election is the first Saturday. In oh, May. okay. So the 21st instead of the 14th? That sounds right. It's fine for me. I think that's fine for me. Um, I may. I may be traveling, so. And in the event that you're traveling, um, would is this like you're traveling for three weeks or you're traveling for a day? Uh, traveling for a couple of weeks, and it's prob probably leaving just before that. Tuesday the 21st. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that you would be available like uh, uh, probably available the, probably available the 14th. So my, my schedule is getting pretty complicated after the semester is over. Yeah, so. I, I, 14th isn't even a yeah, so I know you can. possibility for me. So. What about the first Tuesday? Or maybe we don't need to meet at all. <laughs> <laughs> It worked well to skip March. Uh, we could do it on the second Wednesday of the month, which would be the 8th. The 8th? I think that would work for me. I could do that. I think so. Oh, uh, could we? No. I'm going on the seventh. I'm sorry.
No. Why don't you get back to me on your availability on the 21st and okay. in the event that, that you're not available, I think we'll just go with the 21st without you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it's likely I, I will be gone. It's, it's a wedding in Europe of Beth's cousin, so I just... That, that Saturday, and so I think we're going to try to leave by then. So. Okay. All right. Anything else? Um. Oh, I was just curious what happened with the caucus and. Uh, um. Oh yeah. Yeah, the caucus nominee was here, uh, Stephen. Uh, oh, I know this. Um, oh, so we're gonna have two Steves. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that was the only uh, nomination uh, for the... Did he show up for the caucus? Is that what yeah. happened? Yeah. Oh, okay. The whole Breer clan didn't... was here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And Peter yeah. didn't show up? He did not. Oh, okay. So that's what happened. Uh, and that's... Uh, so that will uh, complement our uh, board of five again. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah. else? Um, uh, gosh, I feel like I was supposed to run, um, something I was supposed to, oh, no, I was supposed to ask about, and I had it written on the piece of paper, and I forgot to bring the piece of paper, <laughs> darn it, um, no. all right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay.